Hi, my name is Rhys. I'm the Director of Children's Policy at Reset Australia um, and I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. I'm really delighted to be here, um, even if it is virtual. Now, I appreciate that in your broader discussion around childhood in an increasingly digital age, you're probably discussing a lot of um, difficult things today, from harms to risk to case studies where things went wrong. And after this month's absolutely wild revelations from Frances Hagen about Instagram and young people's mental health, these are really important to discussions to have. But I'm hoping that what I'm here to talk about today is a slightly more positive message. I'm here to talk about how the digital world can change and indeed how it is being changed in ways that are better for children. The digital world did not arise fully fledged like Aphrodite from the ocean. Um, rather, it is the way it is because people made decisions and people built it that way. And people can make different decisions. So I'm not here to talk about literacy programs, nor how we could skill up children and young people or their parents to keep themselves safe in the digital world. All of those are really important things. Um, but if you look at a pathways of intervention, if you look at a, a process of intervention, families and children really should be the last line of defence. They shouldn't be bearing the responsibility. So who should be on the front line? Who should be making these changes? Well, there's two bigger players. One is big tech, but the second big player in the room is governments. Governments make rules all the time about, you know, what businesses can and can't do. And we really need government to step up to the plate and hold companies to account for the digital world that they're making for children. And this is where I have my cheery news. It is actually possible for governments to regulate big tech in ways that benefit children, and many governments around the world are starting to do so. We're seeing the emergence of new forms of regulation that really move beyond sort of, you know, content moderation or takedown. Again, these are really important tools, um, but alone they won't be enough. Um, but we're starting to see regulations that are trying to go upstream and really address some of the harms that come from the business model of these big tech companies. Now, the common description of social media and big tech's business model is advertising based, but that's a little bit simplistic. It's actually more accurate to describe these companies as sort of monopolies built on the ownership and profits from big data. Through the sort of algorithmic curation, through linking and analysing data points about billions of users, they're not only able to sort of predict users' behaviour and thought, but also to actively shape it. And this is hugely valuable. In fact, it's really the source of big tech's economic and also their political power. So if you can regulate this, you can regulate their ability to harm. And in the UK, that's what we've seen. Really championed by the Five Rights Foundation, Parliament passed the Age Appropriate Desire Code, which came into force in September this year. This act specifies that under the UK's Data Protection Act, children's data can only be collected and processed where it is in their best interests. And children's best interests have to trump commercial best interests. We saw a breadth of changes introduced into the digital world in anticipation of this, from TikTok and Instagram defaulting children's accounts to private, to more systemic changes like companies being required to do data protection impact assessments for children or to build age appropriate products in the first place. We saw movement where governments regulate tech companies must follow. And following on from this, we've seen similar codes, not the statutory law, but as guidance around how to interpret GDPR in Sweden, the Netherlands and France, and Ireland has a draft code out too. All of these follow that same principle of introducing the best interest principle um, into data protection law. And in the US, moves are afoot too. There's two bills in front of Congress at the moment. In the House, Kathy Cast has got a privacy bill out and Senator Blumenthal has got the Kids Act in front of the Senate. Now, while the US doesn't have a federal data regulator, both of these um, propose making the best interest principle um, a guiding sort of um, tool that the FTC could regulate on. And in Australia, in my hometown, we're looking at this too. As part of an ongoing review of our Privacy Act, which is our data protection laws, we've been pushing for the development of regulations that ensure children's data is only used and collected in ways that's in their best interest. And as I record this talk, we're eagerly awaiting the draft of this bill, which we're expecting this week, although we've been expecting it for a few weeks now, but suffice to say it's imminent. This bill would really pave the way for the development of a code, the first outside of GDPR that describes what can and can't be done with children's data to curb that undue power that tech wields from big data 
and really try and reimagine the digital world as functioning for children. So that's my upbeat message for today, that regulation is possible, that it works and it moves her afoot globally. I hope this provides useful food for thought in your other discussions today and please do feel free to reach out to me online if you've got any questions or queries. Thank you for the privilege and for listening to me today. Hello, my name is Sonia Livingstone at the London School of Economics and Political Science and I was asked to talk about the age appropriate design code which is also called the children's code uh, in Britain. So the code is a statutory code produced by the UK's Data Protection Authority, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, as required by the Data Protection Act of 2018. And that was legislation introduced to implement the General Data Protection Regulation of Europe international law. It's a form of statutory guidance and sets out the requirements of the GDPR as they apply to children who are recognised as a vulnerable audience requiring special consideration. And courts and tribunals must take its provisions into account where relevant. So the code, interestingly, draws on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and it helps companies apply um, the data protection regulation in a child rights respecting manner. It provides that the best interests of the child must be a primary consideration when companies design and develop online services likely to be accessed by a child defined as a person up to the age of 18. And it advises that a data protection impact assessment should be carried out. So it's a code of practice on the age appropriate design of relevant information society services that are likely to be accessed by children. And note that the scope of that extends well beyond services that were designed for or deliberately um, intended for children. It's all services likely to be accessed by children. And the code applies to both UK based companies and non UK companies who process the personal data of UK children. In practice, most for profit online services are covered by the code apps, search engines, social media platforms, online messaging, content streaming services, online games, news, educational websites, and any websites offering other services or goods to users over the internet, as well as electronic services for controlling connected toys and other connected devices. So the code takes a risk based approach and it contains 15 standards that online services need to follow. They have to provide a high level of privacy to all under 18s by design and default. They must avoid using children's data for purposes that are not in children's best interests. They mustn't broadcast or share a child's location by default and they must indicate clearly whenever location settings are activated. They must ensure that children's data are not used to auto recommend harmful material. They must turn behavioural advertising off by default for children. They must not nudge children to make choices that reduce their privacy. They must uphold the policies and community standards, including age restrictions that a child has signed up to when using a service. They must establish the age of their users to a level of certainty that's appropriate given the risks arising from the processing of the child's data. They must explain the nature of the service in child friendly language and provide easy to use tools to allow children to exercise their data rights. So, as you can see, the code has serious implications for designers. And just recently, the ICO worked with 140 digital designers to co-create a design guide so that they can embed the code standards into their individual design processes. The ICO has also explained what the best interests of the child means within an international child rights framework, helping to create a deeper understanding of the full range of children's rights as they apply in the digital environment and why these matter. In effect, this is or it should be the implementation of privacy by design and by default that general comment 25 on children's rights as they in the in relation to the digital environment um, requires of all states worldwide, according to the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So it seems that regulation works in anticipation of the 2nd of September 20, 
2021 when the code came into force, several big tech companies made some key changes required by the code, and this impacted their policies not just in the UK but across their global operations. So Instagram will no longer allow unknown adults to direct messages um, to under 18s. TikTok users under the age of 16 will have their accounts set to private by default. Google has promised to stop targeted advertising to under 18s, taking children out of the business model. And they've also introduced safe, safe search by default. YouTube is removing autoplay to prevent children being fed endless videos and a number of other well-being features about time off and time out are being introduced across the sector. This is just the beginning. There are real issues of compliance and enforcement for the Data Protection Authority, the ICO. Companies who breach the code and put children at risk will be eligible for a fine of £17.5 million or 4% of their annual worldwide turnover. And research for children and parents shows that they've been calling for such interventions for a long time. They feel strongly that in today's digital world, data matters for their privacy and their privacy online matters for their safety, their dignity and autonomy, their civil rights and liberties and their fullest development. So it is a hugely welcome development in the UK with likely consequences going much wider. Time will tell if there are any unanticipated or adverse consequences, such as providers installing age gates to reduce services accessible to children. And time will also tell what the real benefits are to children's privacy and other rights. Hola a todas y a todos. Mi nombre es Leonel Bros y soy director del Núcleo de Inteligencia Artificial y Sociedad del Instituto de la Comunicación e Imagen de la Universidad de Chile. Cuando hablamos de regulación en relación a la protección de los derechos de niñas, niños y adolescentes en Latinoamérica, lamentablemente todavía no tenemos un amplio desarrollo en la materia y menos en relación a leyes que sean en, en lo particular vinculantes. Eh, es evidente que cuando pensamos en regulación de los derechos de niñas, niños y adolescentes, incluso en el ámbito digital, debemos tomar como base las convenciones internacionales sobre los derechos humanos y, en este caso en específico, la Convención de los Derechos de los Niños. Eh, hace no mucho tiempo se publicó el comentario número 25 en el cual eh, tuvimos la posibilidad de participar eh, y que en el fondo lo que hace es ampliar las especificaciones en relación a los derechos de niñas, niñas y adolescentes, pero en la esfera digital. Eh, Chile, eh, que es el país donde radico, es el único país de la región que no cuenta actualmente con una ley de garantías para la protección de la infancia y la adolescencia. Y, y acá no estoy hablando en específico del ámbito digital, sino que no cuenta con una ley de garantías para la protección de la infancia y adolescencia. A pesar de que el Comité de los Derechos de la Niñez de las Naciones Unidas lo ha recomendado por mucho tiempo, el hecho de implementar esta ley o al menos un sistema de protección integral. En el país actualmente existe una normativa que data del año 1999, es la ley 19628, y que refiere a la protección de la vida privada y de sus ciudadanos. En ninguno de sus artículos menciona a niñas, eh, y como se imaginarán por el año de la publicación de la ley, eh, menos eh, en términos de protección en la esfera digital. Sin embargo, es, eh, por ejemplo, cuando hay infracciones por temas de, eh, de privacidad, de, us de usos de datos sensibles, se acude a esta ley que está totalmente desfasada en el tiempo. Y en relación a las tecnologías emergentes, y que tiene un poco más que ver con la línea mía particular de trabajo e investigación, que es la inteligencia artificial, me gustaría mencionar muy brevemente, para cumplir con los tiempos de cinco minutos, dos documentos, dos iniciativas que considero que son eh, importantes, relevantes, con sus este, virtudes y sus defectos, eh, pero que mencionan en particular eh, a niños, niñas y adolescentes. Una es la Estrategia de Inteligencia Artificial de Chile, que desde mi perspectiva no es una estrategia, sino que es eh, un conjunto de principios o de deseos para futuro, eh, que desde ya no tiene poder vinculante, pero lo que sí me parece interesante es que en varios de sus apartados incluye referencias a los derechos de niñas, niños y adolescentes. En particular, la, eh, por ejemplo, la generación de recursos educativos sobre inteligencia artificial, la posibilidad de que todo niño, niña y adolescente pueda alfabetizarse en estos temas, 
no solamente para poder usar estos sistemas, sino para poder abordarlos de manera crítica. Habla de una reformulación del currículum en, en la educación formal para incorporar, por ejemplo, temas como pensamiento computacional y otras habilidades que son necesarias para el desarrollo de la inteligencia artificial. Bueno, y sobre todo es el hecho de considerar los intereses y visiones de grupos subrepresentados y hace una especificación eh, en especial a niños, niñas y adolescentes. Esta es una iniciativa que fue levantada a partir de una consulta ciudadana y rescata estos elementos relacionados con niños, niñas y niños, niñas adolescentes que eh, me parecen muy relevantes y que de alguna manera sientan precedentes. La otra iniciativa que no quiero dejar de mencionar es el marco ético para la inteligencia artificial del gobierno de Colombia, que fue liderada por Armando Guío eh, y asesorada por un conjunto de expertas y expertos eh, regionales e internacionales, y que incluye en su principio, si no me equivoco es el principio 10, no sé si no es 10, pero creo que es el 10, eh, los derechos de niñas, niños y adolescentes. También menciona los temas que recién comenté en la estrategia chilena eh, en relación a la educación, pero hace hincapié que en ningún caso se puede justificar la implementación de un sistema eh, de inteligencia artificial si va en detrimento del interés superior eh, de las y los niños. En ese sentido, lo que propone también este principio es eh, promover programas educacionales que faciliten la comprensión de esos sistemas, pero también aboga por la ética de datos, la ética del uso de datos, en el sentido que los datos de esta población niños, niñas y adolescentes, no pueden, ser, no pueden ser utilizados salvo en aquellas actividades relacionadas con su interés superior, cosa que sabemos hoy en día no estaría sucediendo. Eh, y el otro punto que también me pareció relevante es la ética de los algoritmos, en el sentido que el diseño y desarrollo de los algoritmos debe ser siempre comprensible para niños y adolescentes. Eh, quizás destacar también la necesidad de participación de niños, niñas y adolescentes en todo el proceso, desde el diseño hasta implementación y uso de inteligencia artificial, utilizando metodologías eh, adecuadas que realmente no solo incorpore las voces en términos de escucha de niños, niñas y adolescentes, sino que realmente se incorporen sus aportes y visiones en estas in iniciativas eh, relacionadas con inteligencia artificial. Muchas gracias. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis très heureux de partager ce moment avec vous et je voulais vous remercier pour votre invitation. Si j'ai la chance de m'exprimer lors de ce colloque, c'est parce que en France, j'ai fait voter il y a quelques mois une loi qui est une des premières à l'échelle du monde qui vient encadrer ce que j'ai appelé le travail des enfants sur Internet, ou plus spécifiquement euh, l'activité des enfants influenceurs et pour être tout à fait exact euh, euh, l'exploitation commerciale de l'image des enfants sur les plateformes en ligne. C'est un travail que j'ai commencé il y a plusieurs mois en me rendant compte que euh, les règles protectrices euh, qui protègent euh, en France les enfants mannequins ou les enfants acteurs ou les enfants chanteurs eh bien, ne s'appliquaient pas aux enfants qui produisaient parfois euh, dizaines de vidéos euh, regardées des dizaines de millions de fois générant sans aucun doute des dizaines de milliers euh, d'euros de revenus. On le sait d'ailleurs sur certains cas euh, aux états unis par exemple, des dizaines de millions de dollars de revenus. Et donc, euh, avec euh, les services de l'Assemblée nationale, ici en France, nous avons euh, identifié le juridique qui permettait finalement à des parents euh, d'utiliser l'image de leurs enfants, la popularité de cette image, pour euh, en faire des influenceurs qui, euh, par la suite, permettent la monétisation de vidéos, le placement de produits, et donc de générer des revenus. Des parents qui, au fond, sont euh, euh, soumis à un conflit d'intérêts. Parce que, d'une part, ils sont, en droit français, les protecteurs de l'image de leurs enfants et puis d'autre part parce que cette image peut leur apporter de l'argent et ce conflit d'intérêt pour les parents, il ne faut pas s'en cacher est très souvent synonyme de conflit de loyauté envers les enfants qui peut être en tout cas jusqu'à présent c'était le cas ne pouvaient pas vraiment être protégés dans le cas où ils ne souhaitaient pas 
tout simplement prendre part à cette vidéo. Et donc j'ai euh, beaucoup insisté sur le fait que le travail des enfants est interdit, même sur Internet. Et donc euh, les premières dispositions de la loi viennent rappeler qu'un euh, enfant qui euh, suit un scénario, un enfant qui suit une mise en scène, euh, lorsqu'il s'agit y compris euh, de manger des bonbons, de déballer des jouets, euh, lorsqu'il s'agit d'obéir à des consignes du scénario, de la mise en scène, eh bien cet enfant est dans une relation de travail et qu'à ce titre-là, il faut le protéger dans les horaires de travail, il faut le protéger dans son consentement à travailler, il faut le protéger, bien entendu, dans ses intérêts financiers euh, pour faire en sorte que l'argent qui est généré par cette activité, et encore une fois, ça peut aller jusqu'à plusieurs dizaines, plusieurs centaines de milliers de dollars du fait de la monétisation et du placement de produits, eh bien que cet argent soit... Euh, euh, sanctuarisé, mis sur un compte en banque dont il pourra bénéficier euh, au moment de son émancipation, très souvent au moment de sa majorité. Et l'immense majorité des enfants influenceurs qui connaissent un grand succès rentrent dans cette euh, définition d'une relation de travail qui repose notamment sur euh, l'identification d'une consigne. Il y avait euh, une zone grise, bien entendu, comme euh, très souvent sur Internet, euh, cette zone qui fait que parfois un enfant... Euh, peut voir son image exploitée sans pour autant être dans une relation de travail. Je prends souvent le même exemple. Vous avez un enfant euh, qui joue bien euh, au football, un garçon ou une fille qui joue bien au football. Vous le filmez pendant son entraînement, pendant ses matchs. Vous faites un beau montage avec euh, ces images-là. Et puis, euh, une entreprise vient vous solliciter pour que dans la prochaine vidéo, il porte des chaussures ou, euh, euh, ou un maillot de telle ou telle marque. Dans ces cas-là, on ne pourrait pas qualifier cette relation de travail. Euh, mais pour autant, l'enfant euh, génère de l'argent et il faut le protéger aussi dans ses intérêts financiers, bien entendu, mais aussi euh, sur euh, le fait que sans pour autant lui donner des consignes, on pourrait aussi l'encourager à faire, à faire, à faire, à faire de, 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 certains types d'activités pour qu'à la fin, on puisse avoir des images exploitables, etc. Donc, on crée euh, euh, une nouvelle catégorie d'activités qui n'est plus tout à fait du loisir, plus tout à, pas tout à fait du travail, mais qui euh, nécessitait d'être encadré, et c'est euh, l'article 3 de, de la loi. Bien entendu, pour euh, surveiller ce phénomène qui est croissant à l'échelle de la planète, on a besoin euh, euh, de collaborer avec les plateformes, et c'est euh, les dispositions, les articles suivants, qui euh, obligent les plateformes à collaborer avec les associations, à collaborer avec euh, le régulateur de l'audiovisuel ici euh, en France, euh, qui euh, pourra faire un rapport, euh, sur euh, ce qui est mis en œuvre par ces plateformes pour euh, signaler le signalement, pour signaler le recensement, pour, à la fin, signaler tout simplement euh, aux autorités, qu'elles soient administratives ou judiciaires, les cas qui euh, lui seraient euh, signalés par des utilisateurs ou pour les associations qui surveillent cette activité. Et puis, euh, il y a quelque chose de fondamental dans cette loi aussi, puisque nous avons renforcé le droit à l'oubli numérique. Euh, on peut aussi parler du droit à l'innocence numérique. Il faut qu'un enfant puisse demander lui-même, sans l'accord de ses parents, la suppression de vidéos qui auraient été postées par ses parents, tournées par ses parents, pour, que, pour générer des revenus, mais que l'enfant ne souhaiterait plus voir sur les réseaux sociaux, sur les plateformes, même s'il n'a pas encore atteint l'âge de l'émancipation et l'âge de la majorité. Et donc, c'est tout cela que nous avons mis dans cette loi qui est... Euh, au-delà de la question des enfants influenceurs, pose, euh, je crois, un jalon important qu'il faudra poursuivre à l'échelle de l'Europe et au-delà des pays qui s'emparent de ces questions, et euh, de nombreux pays euh, s'emparent de ces questions. Euh, C'est la question du droit à l'image des enfants à l'ère numérique. Euh, C'est une euh, question qui... Euh, concerne finalement euh, chacune et chacun d'entre nous, parce que chacune et chacun d'entre nous avons euh, 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 cette tentation, ce plaisir aussi parfois de partager euh, euh, l'image de nos enfants, euh, eh bien, euh, il ne faut pas le faire euh, sans avoir une vraie réflexion euh, sociétale sur, euh, sur cette question qui est euh, quel droit à l'image pour nos enfants à l'ère numérique euh, parce que derrière, effectivement, euh, il y a potentiellement beaucoup de conflits d'intérêts et cette loi commence à poser les bases d'un règlement. So when I, when I see children making demands on their parents because they have seen an advert and wants to have that demand met, 
I ask myself, are these children mindful of what they are doing? Can they analyze what the effect of having or not having that particular thing they are asking for or product uh, will do to them? And again, it also brings my mind to asking myself a number of questions. Is there a way we can ensure that children don't have uh, certain adverts being shown to them? Or can we go by a watershed system where um, we can guarantee that at a particular time of the day, these are not working, these adverts should not be going out to children? Or again, I'm, I also think about the social marketing side of things. Would it have to be done at a decentralized level whereby parents will not have to be filling in the gap or it should be the school, the school system? So those have been some of the things I think about when I see uh, the way adverts or other content are pushed down the throat of children and young people. And I will say that it has become a, a big issue in Africa as well, because uh, in our context, for instance, we don't have standards. We don't have uh, protocols in place which will help regulate whatever goes out to children and young people. So for me, as someone working in the space and uh, having had encounters with children, not because they have a high-end uh, phone, but they have basic phones like uh, feature phones or the normal basic handsets. Yet they are able to see some of those things. It becomes a bit worrying. And looking at it from that angle, I begin to think about the fact that, okay, looking at technology and children, we need to be considering issues of um, the children themselves, what they're doing, what they can do as far as those contents are concerned the processes they use in getting the content to them and technology in itself. How do we then make it so that we are safeguarding the interest of children at the end of the day? And for me, because children are human beings, uh, clearly they're going to use the devices, they're going to create content, they're going to learn with, with the platforms, they're going to be exploited. And they can even end up exploiting other people just by virtue of the fact that they hold devices or they have access to the devices. And the, a clear case is where we have, um, we have to deal with uh, COVID-19, um, which technically migrated all of us into the space. Whether you are prepared or not, you, you are moved into the space. So you have to make a living. You have to, 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 to work. So we telework, and in teleworking, we get children exposed to our devices with content that they should not even have uh, access to if they were in their own space. So um, those have been some of the things that we have also been raising concern about. And we, we come to realize that if we say children are the future of any nation or of a society, and now we have technology woven into their learning environment at school level or any other spaces that they are learning from. Then it calls for us to put proactive measures in place to ensure that we are safeguarding the interests and the, the well-being of these young people. And this cannot be done in a, a single-handed manner or an organization. One organization cannot be the solution maker or solution provider uh, in that regard. It calls for a, a, a multi-stakeholder approach. And at the Africa level, uh, I know there are a number of initiatives which are, being taking, which are taking place at country level as well as at the regional level. And not only with the civil society, but with the government, uh, uh, government as well. So the question is how relevant or how appropriate would uh, those interventions be to children and young people? It's only when we have sessions like this of this nature, discuss among ourselves, to know and learn from each other in order to appreciate how 
these can go a long way to either making or correcting the situations that we might have created. I know countries are far ahead when it comes to uh, putting measures in place so we we would want to be engaging along these lines in order to learn one thing or another and again one thing i would like to emphasize on is the fact that the digital space has accelerated the aging process of children but it hasn't helped or accelerated the maturation process of them for them and we all know that maturation has to do with the biological situation so for us, it's about time we put in place initiatives that will be proactive enough rather than waiting for the thing to happen for us to now be going back to fix them. We want to be proactive, putting measures in place to ensure that children and young people are getting the best or they are maximizing opportunities whilst minimizing the risk that they encounter. Recently, I saw that UNICEF has started a, a robust um, social change uh, workshop for a number of organizations. Yes, uh, these change workshops is one thing having the training is another thing putting them into practice and also another thing contextualizing them to meet the needs of uh, the country or the context in which uh, we are making the design. So yes, those are good initiatives. Uh, and I'll say that is one thing I know I have noticed going on um, across board uh, recent, in recent times. I also see some of the tech organizations putting in place some measures, interventions to, to, to safeguard the, the interest of children or to minimize the risk the, the, their product goes to them. Um, that is a, a conversation for another day. It's not to say that I don't trust what they're doing. But we all know that sometimes they prioritize profit as against the, the well-being of children. So we, as uh, actors in the space, might want to also sit back and subject some of those uh, interventions to scrutiny, just so we are sure that what is being offered is standardized enough and will inure to the benefit of the child at the end of the day. At the organizational level, at Child Online Africa, we, we have a number of uh, initiatives. Uh, one has to do with uh, designing content to, to, to meet the needs of the people that designing content in the local language of the various audience that we engage with. And we feel that that will be one of the ways to empower the consumers enough, just so if it means parents as the the first the primary socialization agent in the home are abreast with the situation then they will be best placed to make informed decisions with these children we also engage teachers uh, at the educational institutions and the educational institutions to ensure that uh, they are incorporating some of the interventions in in their lessons just so it will it will go on a broader scale to impacting the, the lives of uh, children and young people. Uh, one other intervention we do directly with these young people is what we call the Africa Digital Leaders Program. So it's uh, an initiative that is to help um, equip the, the young people from eight years to 14 years with digital literacy and citizenship skills. So they will be able to um spot the red flags should they encounter any of them um, online and know what to do uh in in the long run and uh i think to also look at it from both policy and strategy side we also advocate for the safety by design initiative or safety, safety by design principles so we, we we are currently in discussion with a number of uh, institutions to see how they can subject some of their uh, products to the standards just so we are sure that we are promoting the well-being of the child in a standardized uh, and an acceptable manner at the Africa Union level, yes, there has been a, a number of uh, consultations uh, with regards to uh, designing uh, a strategy, child online protection framework of a sort, which will help 
the the region or the continent in their country specific designs of uh, frame to help uh, uh, protect children and young people as far as the digital space is concerned and so in 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 a nutshell that is what is going on um at the uh, ghana and africa some african countries i would say so we are all for a comprehensive system we are all for a comprehensive approach to ensuring that children and young people are making the most of uh, the space uh, regardless of their age regardless of their maturation level regardless of their digital literacy level or regardless of their um, cognitive abilities. So thank you for the opportunity.